Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so grateful that you could attend the, um, the first Taos August Peace Pilgrimage. I, I want to give thanks to the co-producer. I'm Jean Stevens. I'm the director of the Taos Environmental Film Festival, and I am co-producing this event with Judith Rain, and she's also been a great help with uh, the website, and I couldn't put this on without her. Also, Perry Penick, who's been giving us some web help, and uh, Nishant Neha of Taos High Tech, whom donated their uh, digital check, which helped us be able to put this event on. I also want to thank the TCA and all of its volunteers that have made this event safe uh, since we're all eating outside in the lovely patio that no one seems to ever use, and I'm getting to enjoy that today. Uh, the Taos Arts Council, I want to give a big shout out to. They're the 501c3 fiscal sponsor of the Taos Environmental Film Festival. Thank you to Robin Collier of Cultural Energy, who is recording this event, and the TCA and the Taos News, who have, uh, uh, in addition to Robin's great coverage of this event and in interviewing me and broadcasting it about four or five times, I want to thank them for publicizing this event as well. But mainly this event would not happen without all the filmmakers and the peace panelists that you are about to hear. I am so grateful for their ability to share the essential information that we need to know right now because the, um, we're now going into a new Cold War. And it, unfortunately, it's happening 45 miles upwind from Taos. We are downwinders. And it is very important that everyone realize the danger that we all face in case there was an, a meltdown of some sort or an accident. I would highly recommend a short YouTube called The Encirclement of Rocky Flats. It's a short film about 17,000 demonstrators that circled um, Rocky Flats back in 1983. It's a really uplifting little short film on YouTube. So, in any case, I want to introduce all of the, uh, the terrific panelists that we have today. Starting with Joni Ahrens, she serves as Executive Director of Concerned Citizens for Nuclear Sa Safety, also known as CCNS, which she co-founded in 1988 to address community concerns about the proposed transportation of radioactive, toxic, and hazardous waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory, otherwise known as LANO. It is also my great pleasure to uh, introduce the panelist, Scott Kovac from Nuclear Watch New Mexico. Scott is Operations and Research Director of Nuclear Watch New Mexico, otherwise known as NWNM. Along with other watchdog groups, recently filed a lawsuit against the U.S. government over its expanded production of plutonium cores for the U.S. nuclear weapons modernization plans. Also, Eric Kushner, Taos peace activist that many of you probably are familiar with. Eric was born in Darmstadt, Germany, two months before the bombing of Darmstadt in September of 1944. He earned a master's degree in economics from UCLA and taught at Colorado State College while engaging in property rights research before moving to Taos in 1984, where he has worked as a carpenter. A lifelong anti-war activist, resource planner, Eric has been involved in the Los Alamos study group for more than a decade. I would also like to introduce Ken Myers. Ken founded Veterans for Peace Santa Fe in 2002. In 2012, he was named a Santa Fe living treasure. Since he resigned his commission as a U.S. Marine Corps captain in 1966, he has worked as a peace activist. 
Ken has promoted a variety of causes, including a freeze and cutback of worldwide nuclear weapons. As a global peace promoter, Ken has been active overseas. His professional life focuses on administration, consulting, communication systems, and helping large organizations function better. Our moderator for this evening or is Bud Ryan, and he's the filmmaker, co-filmmaker of the terrific film we screened earlier, The Forgotten Bomb. Bud Ryan is a peace act and justice activist. He made an anti-nuclear documentary with Stuart Overby, of which I just referred to, The Forgotten Bomb, which won Best Documentary from the Irvine International Film Festival in California and is a featured film at the Taos August Peace Pilgrimage today. And he also has a music and political commentary on KSFR. And uh, I'm very happy uh, that he's getting the word out as well and publicized this event. And then Sarah Kotowski, she is a Taos Peace activist and artist. And uh, she has described herself on her website as a student, teacher, gardener, dancer, nurse, mother, sailor, creator, and firebrand. And that's just a few of her talents. Sarah is the founder of the Embudo Valley Environmental Monitoring Group based in Dixon, otherwise known as EVEMG, organized following the May 2000 Cerro Grande fire. EVEMG collected air samples every two weeks for two years to promote the community from Lanol emissions. She is well informed about emergency response at Lanol, as well as using her art to express concerns about nuclear weapons. With that, it is my honor to present this esteemed panel. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. There is a sign-up sheet over here, and uh, it's just your name and your email, and we'd really appreciate it if we could get every, everybody's information. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask the panel, and we'll start with Joni and work our way down, is what brought you to this point about nuke, nukes? What was the spark that got you involved? For myself, I, I'm from New York City. I attended the Million Person March in Central Park when Reagan was president. But that, you know, after that happened, it was out of my consciousness for the most part. It wasn't until I went to Hiroshima and got to go to the Peace Museum in 1991, and that changed my life. So, Joni, what got you where we are with you today? So, mm, so this is a true confession. So before I moved to New Mexico, I was a registered Republican living in San Francisco. So when I moved here in 1986, um, I moved here to go to St. John's College. And I, my orientation in San Francisco was that there were poor people, but it was, there were a lot of reasons why they were poor. But when I moved here and I started to get settled and I went to the Safeway store on the corner of Cordova and St. Francis and saw the food that was available, I was shocked in some ways. And I realized that I was not, I was in a different place. Um, so, on March 24th, 1986, no, 1988, I attended a Department of Energy and New Mexico Environment Department, and I'll call them the NMED. Um, they were going to talk about the proposed transportation of nuclear waste from Lanol to the then unopened waste isolation pilot plant on St. Francis Drive. And they couldn't, does everybody know WIP? Do I need to describe that? Yeah, okay. So 
the meeting was held at the old Sweeney Center, downtown San Santa Fe, and the DOE officials said, trust us, everything's gonna be okay. But they couldn't even get the slide projector to work properly. And then the, the PR person from the environment department stood up and he stood like Nixon, when Nixon said, I'm not a crook, and said, trust us, everything's gonna be okay. And then Don Hancock, which many of you probably know, from Southwest Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, said, don't believe a word you've heard tonight. And he went through point by point about all the problems with not only the WIP site itself, but also the transportation issues. So a few nights later, I got together with my friend Tom O'Dowd in Santa Fe. And because we were both St. John students, we asked the question, what would Socrates do? And we agreed that he would um, create a dialogue. So Tom and I made signs that said whip route and it had the nuclear symbol on it. And we put it on um, old boards that Tom had. And they were pretty, they were pretty big, different, different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. So we went to see Mr. Martinez a lot. Our plan was to put the signs on St. Francis Drive to create the dialogue. And we went to see Mr. Martinez who sold chili and latias on the corner of St. Francis and Camino Sierra Vista. And we went up to him and we said, do you know about WIP? And he said, Yes, it's bad for my children, my grandchildren, and my great-grandchildren. And we said, we have a sign, could we put it up on your property? And he said, I'll go get my hammer. And so after that experience, it was like, oh my goodness, there's so much community support for this, and that's how I got started. Thank you, Joni. Okay. Hello? I'm Sarit Katowski. Um, how I got involved was, I don't really want to go way back. I mean, I grew up in a military family, and you know that pretty much sets the stage for a, a lot of rebellion, you know, when you hit about 11 or 12. And so, rebellious teenager, um, father that was in Vietnam, dating Vietnam veterans, you know, and, and understanding what was going on, you know, with the peace movement. And um, so, you know, just being on the fringes, mostly, of any kind of activism. Um, and so, basically, my my big training started in 2000 after the Cerro Grande fire. I was living in a place in Rio and Medio and out of my bedroom window, or actually first we were sitting outside and saw the giant cauliflower of smoke off of, um, coming off of Lano. And, um, and then at night for many, many nights I could see the transformer towers exploding and the trees exploding on the, on the horizon. And it was really pretty horrifying knowing what was up there. And at the time, I was also working um, for a woman who had environmental illness and, you know, was, had a lot of anxiety besides having to deal with, with her health issues and I was taking care of animals and at the rodeo grounds, the horses and the dogs and the cats and, you know, and so that's, that's where I started. Um, and then Joni came up to Dixon with her, um, with a couple other people, Janet Greenwald from CARD and did a presentation. And after the presentation about the Cerro Grande fire, I came up to her and I said, well, what can I do? And it was really snowballing and very eye-opening and training and so many things. Um, and that's how I got started. 
Okay. Thank you. Eric? Uh, let's see, where, where should I start? I mean, I probably came to uh, anti-war and anti-militarism a little bit late. I probably didn't give it much thought, uh, even in college. Uh, my first exposure was, I think, in 1964 when I assumed that I would, after college, uh, enlist in the service without much thought. Took a course in the politics and government of Southeast Asia from a teacher at Occidental College that just had a very different view of, of what was going on there and at least planted the seed that this might not be a fight for freedom and democracy, but might be a fight for resources, empire, and control. And that kind of sat with me for a while. And uh, again, uh, you know, the, uh, Vietnam was kind of, kind of occupying my mind. And uh, 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 it was, became clear to me that from what I saw and learned living in Los Angeles, that this, this, this was awful and, uh, you know, not a good thing. And I went to college basically as the best choice that I had. I had two friends at that time. If you're a conscientious objector, you went to jail. In fact, a very good f colleague of mine from Occidental who went to jail in lieu of going to the draft uh, 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 later actually became a dean of students at Occidental College. And uh, he... Uh, while he was incarcerated, got involved with Huey Long in that campaign and made me realize he had a fundraiser there for Louis, Huey Long at his house and I met all kinds of amazing activists. <laughs> Who did I say? Oh no, not the governor, Huey Newton, excuse me, yeah. Uh, uh, Hugh, Huey Newton, who got framed basically for, for shooting a police officer. But anyway, all, all that kind of, kind of opened up my, my, my mind. I was an a anti-war activist from that point on, but it wasn't until the Iraq war that I really became involved in nuclear issues. And I might state before I became an economics major, I was a physics major and gotten accepted uh, on a combination with Caltech where at that time as a undergraduate even, you could work on a cyclotron, and I was still kind of interested in that. But anyway, I knew enough to all of a sudden realize that our government was just flat out lying to us. I mean, I mean, it just it made absolutely no physical sense. When they talked about the centrifuge, they would report it as there's a split opinion of whether these metal casings were bomb casings or whether they could be cut in half and used as centrifuges. And the way that papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post reported it was that there was a split opinion on the panel. Half the panel thought that these could be used for centrifuges and the other half didn't. But you had to dig really, really deep to understand that the half that thought they could be used for centrifuges were uh, political sciences, English majors, had no bearing whatsoever in engineering, and every single member on that panel that had any kind of engineering background said, you know, this is ridiculous, these are rocket casings. But it wasn't reported that way. And then, of course, we all know the flame incident and the, the Nigeria, and anyway, I got really involved then when a uh, daughter of my sister, uh, who's in Portland, said, uh, uh, what do you know about the resolution before the UN? Uh, you know, if they don't pass the second resolution, it'll be a war crime. He said, do you have any, you know about, you understand that issue, do you have any contacts in Germany that might help? So that was basically how I got started. From that time on, I worked as hard as I could to make sure that Germany would not pass that second resolution, and it became clear to the world what the United States was doing in Iraq was essentially a war crime. And they're, they were unilaterally entering that without, without the support of the UN. Anyway, and along that process, many organizations and Taos helped. I remember, I can't even think of the lady's name now, Peace Action Taos was one of the first. And through that, somehow, I met uh, 
uh, Greg Mello, who came up here from the Los Alamos study group, and we realized that a member of his board was a childhood friend of mine, you know, so there all of a sudden all these previous connections started going in, and ever since then, I've worked with anybody. I have the highest respect for new quads. I mean, Scott, I think, has done tremendous work. I've met, I met Ken Myers at the uh, LSD, various rallies and talks in Santa Fe. I can't remember how I met you. I think you were on the board of LASD at one time. And Sherry, I met uh, uh, for what you're doing in Budo, water sampling, and then uh, got me to go to the Los Alamos Historical Data Retrieval where amazingly, just almost single-handedly, she got the CDC to come down there and make a study on what uh, data should be kept on harm that's been done to people. And when we got to the point, we realized that we had to do a dose reenactment to really get that data. All of a sudden, the funding from the CDC got pulled, and I just realized what a political game that was. And along that end, uh, many times I've crossed paths with Joni, and I mean, she's just, a lot of what I know about environmental impacts and all that kind of stuff which should be done, I feel like she's kind of my mentor and teacher in that capacity. So I'm just real honored to be part of this group. And I just hope everybody in attendance, you know, uh, looks at what's happening at Los Alamos because to me, it, it's, it's reprehensible. As Lee said, who was uh, chief of staff of both the Army Air Force and uh, not Air Force, it wasn't an Air Force, the Navy and the Marine Corps during World War II. You know, he said the bomb was ridiculous. It had nothing to do with ending the war. And I don't even consider that a bomb. I think it should be called a poison because it is an explosive impact that's so awful. It's what you saw in here. It's the burns and the suffering that you impose on people. I mean, it's the most inhumane thing I've ever seen a human do to another human. So. I just hope that everyone in here wakes up and takes a real good look and uh, you know, thinks about is it valid to compare Los Alamos with Auschwitz on steroids? I mean, is Los Alamos the final solution as the Americans have conceived it? Anyway, okay. thank you for attending. Thank you, Eric. Ken, how did you get started? I grew up during World War II. My dad was in the Marine Corps. Ironically, he was in the Marshall Islands when the bomb went off. And he was very thankful for it because at the time, of course, the word was that this was going to prevent the invasion of uh, the homeland, Japan, and a million deaths, as Bud reported in his, uh, in his film. I ironically, the very first headline, newspaper headline, that I remember reading was, I was in New York City getting on a Long Island train out to where I live, and it was in either a Daily News or Daily Post headline. A-bomb. Yeah, it says A-bomb. And I said, well, now what's that about? Well, quickly found out about what that was about. And, and in, in spite of the fact that, well, my dad will be coming home, I said, this is a pretty horrible thing. Um, but I grew up drinking the Kool-Aid that all Americans grow up with. And uh, my dad was called back into service for Korea. He was a gung-ho Marine. I drank Marine Corps Kool-Aid as well as the standard US Kool-Aid. And so I was very proud when I won a scholarship an NROTC scholarship at Princeton and took a commission in the Marine Corps. I entered the Marine Corps as a gung-ho, America is a great force for good in the world, and I spent eight and a half years on active duty as a Marine Corps officer while the Marine Corps steadily showed me what America really does in the world. So I resigned my commission and started my uh, lifelong avocation as a peace and justice activist, uh, returning to the Cal University of California at Berkeley to get a doctorate in political science. But the nuclear focus became clearer 
1983, a group of high-powered business executives and professionals in the San Francisco Bay Area started a movement called Beyond War. And their intention was to impact the conversation around the presidential primaries in 1984. So they sent out 11 teams to different parts of the United States where there were early primaries. Uh, and one of the teams came to Vermont, where we were living at the time. And a team came down to Bennington, Vermont, to give us an orientation to a world beyond war. And their immediate goal was to get a group in Bennington to start giving these orientations on a weekly basis. And the orientation was a three-part series. And the first orientation was using Helen Cal Caldicott's film about uh, nuclear war. Uh, and uh, my late wife and I gave that orientation about 10 times a year for the next three years. And uh, that was really my start in anti-nuclear activism. Thanks, Ken. Scott? Thank you. Thank you, Bud. Um, in the early 2000s, I had raised my family. The kids were out of the house. I had some spare time uh, that I didn't have before. And I ended up uh, one day helping to put address labels on a newsletter for Nuclear Watch New Mexico. And I never left. So. Uh, So that's, uh, that's, that's how I got involved, thanks. Okay. I was, I was gonna tell everybody on the panel to kind of shorten your answers somewhat, but Scott has led the way with that. So I know one of the premises of us being here is to talk about LANL and what we can do with Los Alamos. So Joni, what do you think is the biggest problem with LANL that we have to face? I, I think there are growing attempts to further colonize northern New Mexico for their benefit is the biggest threat at this point in time besides the plans to expand pit production. Okay, I didn't mean to have it that short though. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to say that we have as, as a community, we stopped three big weapons, nuclear weapons projects during Bush II. The RRW, the Reliable Replacement Warhead, the RNAP, the R Robust Nuclear Earth Penetrator, and the Modern PIP Facility, which we called the Bombplex. We were able to defeat with colleagues Na regionally and nationally and internationally to defeat those projects. But we, the impotence was really in northern New Mexico to stop those efforts. And we need to re-engage ourselves to stop um, the, these plans to uh, further colonize northern New Mexico. Thanks, Joni. Okay, the biggest problem, it, um, I mean, th there's lots of problems. Expanded pit production is huge because we're, deal we're talking about um, producing pits more than Rocky Flats produced and how, um, what a contaminating, absolutely thoroughly environmental contaminations and, and contamination of humans. Um, Issues are how we collected soil samples, water samples, produce samples. And we were a little tiny organization. And no matter what we sampled, we always found radionuclides associated with uh, nuclear weapons production. Cesium-137, strontium-90, plutonium-238, 239. It was all there besides a whole array of heavy metals. And 
basically why were they, how could they collect samples and we never, and they never found anything that was above regional levels. So it's, it's the way that they whitewash everything. They, they water it down just like a good patriarch. They pat you on the head and tell you to go away and say, oh, it, this is just how it is. This is, this is how it is and um, don't bother me anymore. Don't ask any more questions. And so I think, I think it's the, as Joni said, it's the culture, it's the, it's the patriarchy that is um, really the biggest issue, you know, besides the contamination and besides, um, I want to, first I want to acknowledge Martin V. Hill, who was Santa Fe County Emergency Manager when we worked on an emergency um, response exercise around uh, an accident at a uh, material disposal site B that was associated with area uh, TA-21. And so um, community involvement, big issue. That's all I'm going to say right now. And besides, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Yeah, for me, it's the smiley face that Lionel puts on everything, that there's nothing wrong really going on up there. Uh, we're smart enough and we've got your best interests at heart, so don't worry. Uh, since I was so long, the last time I'm gonna be, may try to make up for it this time. I, I couldn't, I think, I don't know if I can say it any better than Joni said it in her short introduction that I'm in the tent basically is to colonize New Mexico, they think that you're dumb enough and don't understand economics enough that you can uh, confuse the dollars going into Los Alamos is somehow, somehow translating into benefits, although, you know, it's basically the lie of false precision, you know, you throw so many numbers and data and experts and everything at somebody that uh, there is no, no effective opposition. But it, as uh, Joni said, the danger is, is that they're stupefying us. We're going to eventually be, end up with a pile of trash, and nobody's going to help us clean it up and pay for it, and they're just going to say suckers. You know, it's just they can't get, get rid of the ring. I mean, nuclear weapons are the vehicle for world domination, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Joe Gerson has documented 60 times where we've uh, interacted politically with nations, you know, to, to go forward. But anyway, I need to stop. Thank you, Eric. Ken? I am somewhat awed to be on this panel with folks who really know a hell of a lot more about what's happening and what has happened at Los Alamos than I do. Uh, you know, so I, I am happy to to march behind Joni and Scott and others who really dig into the details. And the devil is in the details. And these are the folks who know the details. And so I follow in their wake. Uh, to me, the biggest challenge is overcoming the lies. You know, that we are continually fed about the need for what goes on up there in the first place. Uh, and to just constantly get the truth out, as these folks do. Thanks, Ken. Scott? Thanks. Um, I've been, lately, I've been looking at uh, Los Alamos Laboratory as a dirty bomb that's exploding in slow motion. It's, it's the, the, because it's a, a laboratory, they've disposed of basically every type of contaminant. They use solvents, radio, radionuclides, and they've been letting it go and into the, you know, releasing it into the environment for 75 years now. And so that's, that's the a main problem. The other, the other problem is the money. And it, the money uh, is very attractive. And they, you know, people do and say things to 
continued to keep their jobs. And, you know, currently it's the supposed need for pit production at Lanel and at Savannah Riverside in, in uh, South Carolina. Both of these sites are uh, being proposed to uh, produce 80 pits, uh, plutonium pits, which are the cores of nuclear weapons. Um, so they're, they're planning on 50 at, at South Carolina and 30 at Los Alamos. And, you know, they've been allowed to do 20. And they, the last time they did any, they, they produced 11 one year back in 2012 and haven't produced any. And so it kind of, kind of shows that we don't really need them. I mean, we, you know, I mean, physically we didn't make any for, for 10 years. You know, we made 30 a, a few, for a few years in the 2010s and 2011 and 2012. We made a total of 29 or 30. And it just goes to show how much we don't need them, how much it's all about money, and you know why you know Los Alamos should stop making plutonium pits. Thank you, Scott. So, what what can we do to wake the public up? Uh, look, everybody on this stage, at one time or another, or all the time, is working to get more of you people involved and create a groundswell. You know, I said that I was there for the million person event in New York City, and you know, it, it kind of melted after that uh, to an extent. Uh, you know, so what can we do to re-engage the public? Joni? Um. <clears throat> I would encourage folks that it's time, we need to stop WIP expansion. DOE is planning to double the size of WIP and they're moving in a very incremental way to avoid having to show us the full picture of what they have planned. Um, and so I'll say that. And number two is that we have a new tool on January 22nd, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons went forward, and 50 countries um, ratified, signed and ratified the treaty. So it's in effect, and it needs to be something that we're talking about, is how are we investing, um, and Scott will probably talk about this, you know, there's been a billion dollars extra that is in Lanel's budget for nuclear weapons in the last, Two years, Scott? Yes. In the last two years. So there's $2 billion on the table right now, and we need to stop that money by saying, if we have $2 billion, we need brand, broadband in northern New Mexico. We need help with education, health care, all of these roads, the whole thing. And we don't want you to spend that money on pit production. We want that money to be available for the community that has suffered since 1943 with the irresponsible handling of these materials that Scott d described and Sherry described that are throughout northern New Mexico. So thank you for signing on to the Stop Forever WIP. Uh, and I'm just gonna say one more thing. It, in my view, D, the Department of Energy is holding New Mexicans hostage with um, this whole thing that they need to expand pit production, but they also need to expand WIP. And the important thing is, is that when I started back in the day, WIP was supposed to close 25 years after it opened. And that year is 2024. And they're trying to keep WIP open until 2080. Thanks, Jimmy. Sarah? I think the, what, what we can do is we have to have more community outreach. People have to get educated about what, what the cost is the, the human cost, the, env the environmental cost 
Um, I'm really happy to see all of you people here, but next time you come to one of these events, bring somebody else. You know, you have to spread the word. If you're not spreading the word, it's not getting out. Use your social media. The new generation of our congressional delegation, they got elected through social media. And you know what? Don't say I'm too old to do that because you're not too old. I can do it. Anybody else can do it. Um, you know, don't, don't argue with people about nuclear weapons. What you have to do is present them with, with facts, details. Did you know that to enrich 150 tons, uh, to make 150 tons of weapons grade plutonium, you have to enrich 10,000 tons of plutonium or of uranium. How, what are you gonna do with all that, all that tonnage of depleted uranium, you know, when in the processing? There's, there are so many questions you can ask. Did you know the first nuclear weapon was exploded in the Tularosa Basin and that people continue to suffer from that? Did you know that Lanol is crap at emergency response? You know, they don't know what they're doing and your, your emergency managers in the county, they, they aren't participating. Participation, community outreach, this is the only way that we're gonna, that we're gonna get anything done. And sign all of Joni's petitions, CCNS. Look at our look at our websites. Look at you know, look at Scott's website. Look at the websites. They're going to give you a lot of information. These people are experts at what they do. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, bud. Eric. Uh, yeah, I, I I concur with everything that said so far. I I, I uh, am aware that the uh, there's a great deal of harm that comes from the production of the bomb in terms of medical, both in the mining and the transportation and the manufacture and so on. Uh, and, but to me, the, the real focus is just the, uh, the, uh, the inability to, to uh, uh, somehow engage the community in an honest discussion, because it basically comes down, one pit costs about $50 million. In this day and age of climate change, uh, school issues, housing issues, food issues, and so on, to 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 allow uh, greedy people or just to use the atomic bomb as a big cash cow and to hold the rest of us hostage when there's so many better uses of that money. We have to engage in that conversation, and some of our commissioners are. I think at the county level, we have a majority. Of, of politicians that understand that. And anyway, I'll stop there, but I, I just do want to put in a plug for Nuquash. If you go to pit production and uh, modernization, uh, it's nuquash.org or com? Dot org? Dot org. I mean, very uh, succinct. I, I work close, more closely probably with the Los Alamos study group, but I've got to say that's for people that want to do a deep, deep, deep dive. And as Sherry said, that's not really necessary. I think you'll get all that you need from nukewatch.org. Thank you. Thanks. Ken? I wonder how many New Yorker cartoons that have been over the years that feature a bedraggled looking person on a street corner holding a sign that says, the end is near. Well, folks, the end is near in two ways. I mean, we are facing two existential crises, one being the, obviously, the global climate change crisis, and the other is the insanity crisis of continuing to build these weapons that can't be used, you know, and sucking up all our resources that need to go to places where we can make a positive difference, and we simply have to wake up the community and wake up our neighbors any way we can think of. And I'll say right now, 
the next time our congressional representatives come up for re-election, I'm going to be out there charging them with betrayal of the American people for continuing to support the ridiculous waste of money that's only going to poison us and to create weapons that can't be used, and it's absolutely reprehensible. And I don't, I don't care. Yeah, yep, that's enough. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Scott. All right, thank you. Um, I would just say support your local activists, and there's several ways to do that. You know, sign petitions, send money, uh, show up at meetings, bring your friends. There's a, uh, you know, that's one level. You know, give Joni or give me a call and ask, you know, is there some report? Because we spend a lot of time reading, reading environmental reports, and we, we can use some help, you know, doing that. And, and, you know, that is the hardest part of my job is to translate the technical jargon from the Department of Energy into something that, you know, what it means, what it means to the average person on the street. And, and that's, uh, that's what we try to do. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And the challenge is that there's a lie on every page. So there's, there's anti-nuclear activists from around the country that once a year go to Washington, D.C. to lobby elected officials to stop this madness. I went one time with Stuart, the woman I made the film with. Uh, Joni was there. I think Scott was there that year. Uh, Jay was there. And I would never go back again. I was so frustrated. There was a point where Bingaman, I wanted to wring his neck. But my question to everybody up here on the panel is, should we engage with our Congress people and our senators? And if you think we should, how should we engage with them? Because I've watched Joni and Scott, you know, talk to these people and I see them nodding to them and then they support the labs 100%. So what do you think, Joni? How do we engage politicians or should we? I think we have to get more of a grassroots effort going so that they can't dismiss us. Okay. I don't know, pitchforks might work. Um, you, you have to engage them and I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how you do that. I mean, these elected officials for the most part are politicians and they're slippery and slimy and um, it's really hard to have respect for them. But other than just masses of people outpouring, I don't know how many postcards I've counted, how many postcards I've signed. And you know what? Postcards are effective. When you hand somebody a stack of postcards that's two feet tall, you know, they, they can't ignore that. And so, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of ways you can engage them besides, <sighs> let's see, issues, Issues are always good. And what do you call that, bird dogging? You got to bird dog these people. You go to the meetings where they're there and you, you lay out some information and then you force them to answer the question in a way where they sound really bad if they agree with it. You got to shame them into it, really. It's about all I can think of to do with a lot of them. Thanks. Too often money is obviously the big thing with politicians and, you know, Lanel is giving them money or telling them there's jobs, blah, 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 and they see if they're going to cut any program, it's going to lose them jobs and they won't get reelected. So we have to be there on the other side, you know, showing them 
there are other voters who were concerned about this other stuff. But Eric, what do you think? Uh, I, I kind of uh, want to second what Joni said. To me, it's all grassroots. I mean, politicians uh, follow. Uh, they don't lead, you know. And until we have a large enough group uh, uh, to kind of put any real pressure on a politician, they're not going to listen to us. And because of the money that Lanel has and the way that the whole Constitution is organized or whatever, I don't, I've even stopped voting at federal elections. I no longer vote for the president or senator or representative because I think that it's so controlled by money, it's just a waste of time. I don't feel that way for the roundhouse and for the local people. I mean, like right now, we, we have uh, a majority, I think, on the Taos County Commission that understands that. I think Santa Fe City is getting close to the county, is getting somewhat close. The town is still up in the air, but until we have the support of our local politicians, I don't think anything above and, and at our roundhouse in Santa Fe, I don't think anyone in Washington uh, I mean, we just can't compete. I mean, to me, I don't see how that's productive. I, I agree that bird dogging is important uh, as a way of educating not the congressman, not the senator, but the other people in the room who may be susceptible to education. And similarly, uh, public demonstration outside of our elected official offices, get as many people as you can to go. And again, it's a educate the public, uh, not the, the congressman. If we get enough people in the public educated, then that'll take care of the congressman. Thanks, Kim. Scott? Uh, thanks. The, uh, we need to educate the politicians also, and that's kind of our new Quatch's job and, and some, of the, some of the activists' job is to educate the politicians. We need to make, we need to make our, uh, our issues, political election campaign issues. And so, you know, when you ask, you know, when you ask them about taxes or infrastructure, we need to ask them, you know, what is their stance on nuclear, nuclear weapons production at Los Alamos? We need, to, we need to get that out of our politicians and vote for them accordingly and let them know that we are doing that. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. So, there have been a lot of positive outcomes that have happened recently in terms of nukes. Uh, you know, I would say that the UN declaring them illegal is a huge thing. Uh, you know, when Schultz and Kissinger and that group came out against nukes and said, we can't use these weapons, especially with Kissinger, that blew me away. Uh, so, are you positive, are you optimistic, or pessimistic about where we're headed with nukes? I'm really excited. There's a lot of young people that are involved in, in this effort around the world. And you can go to the International Campaign on the Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. and so it's ICANW.org. And there's a lot of things going on around the world where young people are taking the lead to uh, push for um, abolition of nuclear weapons, including the first use campaign, um, no first use campaign. And Ken can talk about that more. And so I'm really excited. I, I think we're at a transition point where the, the teeter-totter is getting balanced out. And so we're waiting for more countries to sign on to the treaty and for more countries to make statements. Thanks. Right. Um I can't say that I'm optimistic, but I'm also not pessimistic about it. I see that there's some hope, and 
yes, the, the next generation, the younger generation is getting involved, which is really positive. I, but I, I'm still, I'm in the middle on the teeter-totter, whether it's going to flip one way or the other. Thank you. Eric? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually kind of optimistic. I mean, as uh, I think it was uh, uh, a Unitarian minister said, you know, the, the uh, arc turns toward justice or something like that in the long run. And, and with what's happening at the UN, and I think people are waking up, and I think with climate change and COVID and homelessness and all the problems that we face, I mean, pretty soon people are going to understand. I mean, the big economic engine is supposed to be in Los Alamos. We've got 70 years of data, and New Mexico is always at the bottom. At what point? Uh, it, it's just like the Russians used to do this. You know, rather than produce good food, they tell you we are producing good food, and rather than producing good schools, they'd say you have good schools. Well, that, that's what we've come to. We're down at the bottom in so many things, and I think just eventually, I think people are, are, are going to wake up. I mean, Los Alamos is going to implode on its own. I don't believe it has the capability of uh, making uh, uh, 30 uh, uh, pits a year safely. So by that token, I think people will slowly wake up, as I, and things will change for the better. Thank you. I'm neither optimistic nor pessimistic. I'm engaged. Uh, and, <clears throat> you know, it appears that in many ways the world's going to hell in a handbasket. It's a little less, it's a little less depressing if you're engaged in trying to do something about it. Uh, so I encourage everybody to, to, to get engaged. Uh, and Veterans for Peace, we have a nu nuclear abolition working group that has a seven-point uh, statement of purpose that begins with no first use, uh, putting pressure on uh, the President, State Department to declare a policy of no first use and making that policy real by deactivating our, uh, you know, our missile, our ICBMs that can only be used in a first use. Uh, and it moves on from there, taking all the weapons off of air trigger alert, storing the warheads separately from the missiles so th to gain time, because they're going in exactly the wrong direction, attempting to get hypersonic missiles and so forth. So nuclear abolition, I think, as you suggested, I think there's getting more interest in it. The question is, do we have enough time? We'll only have enough time if enough people get engaged. Thank you. Uh, thanks. The, uh, I still think that there is time to change things. And I believe that we have not passed the point where, you know, it's futile. I think that, you know, there is time, there is, there, there is hope to keep at it, but it's going to take a lot of work, and it's probably going to take as much work as we've done, and it's going to seem like, you know, we're doing the same thing, you know, 10 years later that we did 10 years ago and 20 years ago, but, it, you know, it all works together, and I think that, uh, you know, there, it, it's going to take, a, you know, it's going to take the community, and, and it's going to take us all to flex our pol political muscle. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, well, this was supposed to end like a couple minutes ago, so uh, thank you. Sh make sure that everybody has signed up on uh, the thing that was passed around. Joni, do you have something you want to add? Um, so we need to be asking our politicians What's the transition plan? What's the plan for transition of LANL from nuclear weapons to something else? So I just wanted to, I remembered that part. So I, what's the plan? Everybody say it in unison. 
What's, What's the plan? The plan? <laughs> well, thank you everybody for being here and thank the panelists for all the work you do to rid the world of these awful weapons. Thank you. Thank you.
species prevail on Earth. We have Jenny Bird, Arthur Mandel, really oddly, really quite good. We have three readers. I think we'll just alternate. I think we should start with Terry. Are you going to read it a now thing? And then now? friends up in El Salto and walked up the path and he was in the school bus where he used to stay and that was my, my beginning in Taos and uh, I just felt so grateful to know him because he was a remarkable person and it's so appropriate to have him because he, in World War II he was drafted by the Japanese Navy and he was 17 years old and they trained him as a um, radar specialist and he was watching the radar screen and saw the blimp on the screen when the American plane got through the Japanese defenses in the sky. And it was the plane carrying the bomb for Nagasaki. And he used to tell that story. So, and then he saw the plane. And so it's just really appropriate. And I. This is really corny and goofy, but I used to uh, read some of his poems. I used to teach the watershed studies program to fifth graders for rivers and birds. And I introduced some poetry into the curriculum. And I would often start with Nanao, because as soon as you say you're going to read poems to fifth graders, they roll their eyes and they moan and groan. So I would start with this, and I would tell them, okay, this is a friend of mine, and I'm going to try to read it in his voice, because he had a very awakened voice. And uh, so this is how I would often start. Miracle! <laughs> Air, wind, water, the sun, all miracle! The song of red-winged blackbird, miracle! Flower of blue columbine, miracle! Come from nowhere, going nowhere. You smile, miracle. <laughs> so that's just, just to, I mean, and now it yeah. just, yeah, that's Perfect. here. Perfect. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a poem that feels really appropriate for tonight. I can't continue in the nails voice though. <laughs> It's the title poem of his book, Break the Mirror. In the morning, after taking cold shower, what a mistake, I look in the mirror. There, a funny guy, gray hair, white beard, wrinkled skin, what a pity, poor, dirty old man. He is not me, absolutely not. Land and life, fishing in the ocean, sleeping in the desert with stars, building a shelter in mountains, farming the ancient way, singing with coyotes, singing against nuclear war. I'll never be tired of life. Now I'm 17 years old, very charming young man. I sit down quietly in lotus position, Meditating, meditating for nothing. Suddenly a voice comes to me. To stay young, to save the world, break the mirror. Mm. <laughs> How close you've come to midnight. Hiroshima, bow. And a second one. The toll of the bell echoes through eternity. Humanity, death. The toll of the bell echoes through eternity. Humanity, death.
I have a group of poems that um, a woman named Georgie Foros, she was a grantee of the Wurlitzer Foundation, inspired by traveling around to the different sites, the Los Alamos site and the Trinity site and the Nevada Test site. And so I'm going to read one of her poems. Um, and I don't read poetry, so I'm going to do the best job I can. <laughs> Ornada del Muerto, July 16th, 1945, 5.30 a.m. Just now, gold-sandaled dawn snatched her skirts from the filthy horizon. Just now, the thunderclouds rumbled. Just now, the jeeps ripped dust plumes from the desert floor. Just now, gold-sandaled dawn brushed lightly the backs of the rabbits. Just now, the gadget was hoisted atop the tower. Just now, the scientists placed their final bets. Just now, gold-sandaled dawn stroked the hides of the cattle. Just now, the soldiers donned protective sunglasses, lit up smokes. Just now, the general paced and roared. Just now, Gold Sandal Dawn tripped past Chupadera Mesa. Just now, the numbers cracked across the airwaves. Just now, the watchers ducked down, covering their heads. Just now, Gold Sandal Dawn dragged her robes across Mount Taylor. Just now, the word that would never to be said again. Just now, her brother from beneath the earth. Just now, her brother from beyond the stars. Just now, her brother cast off his bounds. Just now, her brother flashed his magnesium white shield. Just now, her brother tossed earth to air. Just now, her brother ignited the air. Just now, her brother shook his purple robes. Just now, her brother flourished his golden robes. Just now, her brother rose in red clouds. Just now, her brother sputtered yellow-green clouds. Just now, her brother spat black rain. Just now, her brother fused sand to glass. Just now, her brother showered red-hot dust. Just now, her brother puffed his cheeks and blew. Just now, her brother drifted to the ground to wait. Just now, Gold Sandal Dawn watched the watchers and the doers. Just now, Gold Sandal Dawn did not tear her hair and wail. Just now, Gold Sandal Dawn stepped gingerly into all the days to come. Thank you.